Good morning, and welcome to the United Church of Assonet. The meditation this morning is, Father God, thank you for the joy ahead of head for those who love you. And that comes from our daily bread. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap with their hands, let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. Our opening hymn is They'll Know We Are Christians, and it can be found on the insert. Please stay, stand to sing if you're comfortable and able. followed by the Lord's Prayer. Loving God, remember your child's commandment to love one another as he has loved us. May this time of prayer and reflection remind us of the love we have in Jesus. As we leave this sacred place, may we be filled with joy as we share his love with others. 
We pray as Jesus taught us, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning once again. The flowers on the altar this morning are given by Kathy and Tony Emeron. And they're beautiful, thank you. Um, we continue to need people to sign up for flowers and that sign up is in the narthex. And of course, because my brain is on another planet these days, um, I did not check it. So please look at that to see if there's openings that you might want to sign up for. Um, we also continue to need people to sign up for coffee hour, and that sign up is in the wall in the in fellowship hall. Um, please see insert for the announcing the May breakfast and plant cell sale. And Carolyn, do you have anything to add about that? I hope um, I hope everybody should come. I hope everybody should spread your word, and you'll probably see our little flyers all over town and the libraries and everything else. We're, we're hoping for a great event. Okay. The Old Colony Association is holding its spring meeting on May 19th at 2 p.m., and that's going to be held at the Second Congregational Church in Attleboro. We're also invited to a Pentecost to Zay service, and that's May 19th at 7 p.m. That's over at St. John Newman in East Freetown. Um, it says, in the upper room, if you were there, what would you hear? What would you do? Applications for the Men Brown Scholarship are due by May 26th, and you can give those to Jeff. We're looking um, for people to plan and participate in the, Indep in the Independence Day festivities. Um, and please let Reverend Greg know if you have any Bible study topics you'd like to, for the fall. Um, we continue to collect non-perishable foods for the food pantry, and that box is in the narthex. Reverend um, Baker's blog can be found on his website, which is listed, and also he's available on Fridays for anyone who wishes to see him, and you can cont contact him with your request. Are there any other announcements this morning? Leon. There will be a memorial service for my father on Saturday, May 18th, at 2 p.m. on the D.C. Historical Society. Um, all welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. <coughs> Make sure I have all my pieces here. So you have all the uh, the inserts in your bulletins. Um, you know, if you see someone or find a bare place that you think other people might go by. And even if you had just have this little flyer, uh, this is a great way to, uh, to spread the word. We want to make sure that uh, we do bring back this tradition. Yeah? Just don't put it up the Oh, that's the right, is that? not only take it down, but they will discard it. Okay, yeah, yeah. And that's not the one. That's right, that's got your, I was about to say, wait, that's the one with your name on it. But, I have, yeah. I have other people want to 
Good. I mean, I recommend doing that as, as much as you can within your reason. Don't put it in a place that's not allowed. But point is, spread the word. Talk to your friends. I've been talking to people. I know people have heard, oh, they're doing the May breakfast again. I missed that. I'm excited to go. We'll see how things turn out. But I also do want to say thank you to all the people that have done planning, the people who are uh, volunteering. I think that I'm just very appreciative of everything that's going on. I also want to give a shout out to the um, the um, Old Colony Association Spring Meeting happening on the 19th. Uh, again, we theoretically have uh, a delegate to that um, to to the association. That's something that we're actually talking about with the bylaws committee is making sure that we do elect those delegates. But we do have that. Um, you can come. You can vote on the one piece of business we have, and then there's a wonderful speaker, and then uh, we're gonna talk about church vitality. It should be a very interesting time if you can uh, spend a little bit moment to make it out there. Uh, also, the while we're talking on all those meetings, there will the, there is the um, conference meeting in June. That's for over two days in Amherst. It's a big ask, but if you're interested, I'll let me know and we can talk about it. Are there any other announcements or comments? All right. Then let us now move on to our time of joy and concern. We have our continued prayers today for Sandy White, for Linda Wheelock, uh, for Crystal Robison, for Anne Marie Allen, for Kim Vonica, for Ed Torres, for Michael Denault, for Eunice, for Mary, for Millie Moore, for Franklin McMullen, for David Rizuski, for Pat Gonsalves, for Nick Riccardi, for Bethany Costa, for Bobby Files, for Tony Ribello, for Mark Joes, and for Mr. Mancuso. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Or updates? Yeah? Um, I want to thank everybody for the thoughts and prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I need to do the prayer for my neurologist and my cardiologist is on the same page. <laughs> the neurologist is like, yes, this would help with my strokes, my seizures, my uh, migraines, and whatnot. The cardiologist is like, eh, one in four people has a hole in the heart. Eh. <laughs> so help them to get on the same page. <laughs> Yeah, but the hole in your heart is systematic, is, is, has symptoms, <laughs> so. And that's yeah. what my neurologist was saying. Yeah, okay. Anyway, let's pray for wisdom and discernment for your neurologist and your cardiologist. Other, yes? Continue to pray as well in our body. I also pray as well Yep. Well, so absolutely. So again, continue prayers for Carol. She's got that hip replacement. She's got blood and, and uh, infection issues. We pray for uh, wisdom and discernment for the professionals, which of course comes through the love and will of God. Uh, yes, Mary Lou. Very good. I know they had that May 22nd deadline that wasn't looking. So maybe it's still it's still there, but but hopefully in a week or two after that we'll see them. So that's excellent news. Yes, Mary uh, Donna. All right, there's two. Yep. The easiest one is Jeremy. He's having his first surgery tomorrow um, on Ingrosos. He's having both his big toes done at the same time, and. Um, He's, he's a little nervous. And, uh, you know, I, I've had the same thing. I know it's fine. I've had the same thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, he thinks he's going to be back to work like, you know, two days. So I'm like, just give it a give. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, the other one is actually Matthew. Um, he slipped two discs in his back. Um, so he's in pretty extreme pain. He actually passed out from the pain when I wasn't home. Jared called the ambulance. He 
went to the hospital. Uh, the concern was that you know it was seizure, it was seizure disorder, and um, it was not. It was it was uh, passed out for pain, and so he's back home. He actually gets severe. He slipped two discs, and there's degenerative uh, disease between both of those spots. Uh, so he's understandably uncomfortable. Um, he's on everything he can be on right now safely, and um, he's slowly making progress. So um, it's it's been interesting, and we think we're going to have two boys on the couch. Uh, thankfully, I have recliners on my couch. Mm -hmm. um, do, do they like the same shows? Or are they going to fight over that? Uh, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be on their iPads, so it was oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So again, Jeremy uh, is having some surgery for his toes, um, and then Matthew had slipped two discs. That's a much bigger problem. Is in a lot of pain, and they'll probably be off their feet for a week or so at least. Other prayer requests? Yes. Um, I also want to apologize for uh, the grant issues. I was in the hospital with a lot of the deadline to do. Uh, so I'm still trying for next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we need a prayer for <laughs> So it's just certainly we're very thankful for your work on that. I, I, I know that the making the grants for this year was kind of a long shot anyway, but I know there's a lot of work we can do uh, between you and the trustees working you know, through the trustees and all those other pieces. It's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a lot of good work we're gonna do. Yes. Our neighbor up here a couple of weeks ago was getting his boat ready to be launched mm -hmm. and uh, he was a paint on the boat. Mm -hmm. He fell off the boat on the dock, and uh, his name is Chip Johansson, and he broke um, his F2, his F3, his pelvis, his hip, uh, and three um, ribs. He's out of the hospital, he's home, but he need prayers for healing. So again, that's for Chip Johansson, who uh, fell off his boat while painting it. Um, had a number of uh, broken bones all throughout his um, basic, you know, ribs, spine, hips, yeah, all the way up and down. So uh, certainly prayers for his uh, healing and recovery at home. Any other prayer requests? Yes, Becky. My sister Eunice's surgery went well. Oh, good. I just asked for prayers that she continue to go to her journey, but I'm so grateful that it went well. Very good. That's great. What wonderful news. Oh, I've been praying for extra this week. So yeah, and Eunice had a successful surgery. Always needs more love and prayer. Any other prayer requests? <coughs> then let us be one in the spirit of prayer. Let us lift up our praise to you, O God. Let us lift up our praise, for you have won us the victory over sin, isolation, and despair. You open our hearts to give thanksgiving for our blessings. You hear our confessions of all that we have done wrong and all the good we have not accomplished. And you have forgiven us so that we might abide in your love. Let us abide also with our neighbors. Hear our prayers on their behalf. We pray that amidst shouting and pushing, there may be a willingness to listen and to compromise. We pray that on the eve of Yom HaShoah, the Hebrew, uh, Jewish day of remembrance for the Holocaust, we may understand what those horrors were and how we can best avoid them in the future. We pray for those whose lives are endangered by those unwilling to compromise in the war-torn regions of the world, those whose homes are destroyed, body starved and mutilated and children killed we pray for those who serve others here and abroad we pray for those facing acute and chronic illnesses especially cancer we pray for successful surgeries we pray for those who are grieving and we pray especially for sandy linda krista Anne marie kim ed michael eunice mary millie franklin 
David, Pat, Nick, Bethany, Bobby, Tony, Mark, Mr. Mancuso, Carol, Jeremy, Matthew, and Chip. Hear now the silent prayers of our hearts as we listen to your word for us. O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. <laughs> All right. I have a question, as I always do at this time. Who here likes hard candy? All right, many people do. My wife does not love hard candy because when she was a kid, she overdid it and got a lot of cavities. So we don't have hard candy in my house, but I'm thinking back on sort of the old fashioned hard candies that, that you would have. The ones that have the plastic wrapping with sort of the twists on either end. Uh, and I was thinking of like all the different flavors that they have. And I was thinking of kind of six flavors that always seem to be there. And I want you all to close your eyes and I want to imagine a bowl filled with those old fashioned hard candies. And there's gonna be six flavors, all right? We're gonna have lemon, all right? Peppermint, spearmint, butterscotch, root beer, and strawberry. You see them all in your head? Lemon, peppermint, spearmint, butterscotch, root beer, and strawberry. All right, now with your eyes closed, I want those who would first pick a lemon one, raise your hand. All right. Who here would first pick a peppermint one? All right. How about spearmint? All right. How about butterscotch? All right. Double dip in there. <laughs> Who here would do uh, root beer? Remember, it's the first one you're grabbing, okay? All right, how about strawberry? All right. All right, raise your, open your eyes. Now, one of those candies um, was the most popular, and that one was butterscotch. Which is ironic because a lot of kids hate the butterscotch ones. And uh, so, you sort of, I think it's more of an acquired taste as you get older. But um, there was one flavor that did not get picked at all. And what's that? What was it? I guess lemon. Lemon? Okay. Anyone else? What's, it was, in fact, spearmint. Which is actually one of my favorites. I love the spearmint one. But they're all good, but it shows that when it comes time to be picked, to be chosen, a lot of times somebody gets left off. Now, how many people have here felt like a spearmint hard candy at some point in their lives? <laughs> left out, not chosen. Who here was ever chosen last on the schoolyard when it came to time on recess? Raise your hand. All right. How did it make you feel? Good? Bad? Saving the best for last? <laughs> All right. So it's hard when you're the last one picked. It's hard when it feels like nobody cares about you or nobody thinks that you're the best or maybe thinks that you're worthwhile. Maybe you end up with a, a bowl that's filled with spearmint candies at the bottom that nobody grabbed, you know? But that is not what we're taught in the Bible. We are taught that Jesus does not just choose those that are rich, those that are holy, those that do all the right things. Jesus chooses everybody. Jesus teaches us that our commandment is primarily to love one another as he loved us. So I, now I want you to think today about what that means what it means to pick and to choose the people in your lives and the people that you choose to love. And I hope that you, like Jesus, will try to choose and appreciate everyone.
Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, help us to remember that Jesus taught us to love one another just as you loved him and as he loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus has appointed us to bear fruit that will last, fruit that will bring love and justice, joy and hope. So bring what you can. Together the gifts we offer will transform lives. And this morning's offering will now be received.
us pray. Loving God, remember that one of Christ's most important commandments is loving one another. With these gifts, help us show this love in our words and actions, caring for the vulnerable and offering hope in times of despair. Amen. Our hymn of preparation today is number 335 in the Red Pilgrim Hymnal, and it is, num it is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. The lesson this morning is from 1 John, I'm sorry, my brain, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and that can be found on page 902 in your pew Bible. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God, obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever it is, is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is in truth. The Gospel lesson is from the book of John. It's chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. And it can be found on page 794 and 795 in your pew Bible. 
As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what, he ma what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I choose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these c commands so that you may love one another. And so endeth the reading. Taking my water. Good morning, everyone. We are called to be a we are called to be a people of love. Now we have been called the little church with the big heart. And I think that love is the core of our mission and of our faith. Now, over the last few weeks now, we have examined the first letter of John, which is perhaps the most significant exploration of love in the Bible. We have also looked at the gospel according to John and its description of how the disciples abide in Jesus, the true vine. This theme of abiding in love continues in our Bible lessons today from those same texts. Now, both stress the importance of following God's commandments. And while the Jewish commandments are many and complex, Jesus gives this simple commandment in the gospel according to John. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And the letter echoes this language. In chapter 3 it says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And later in today's reading from chapter 5, we hear, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. Now, in other words, kind of fit all these John passages together, when we commit to a faith in Jesus Christ, we seek to obey his commandment, to love God and neighbor. Now, these are preliminary imperfect steps. We're trying to have faith. We're trying to obey. But these lead us to more perfect steps, to abide with God, and then to act out in true love to the world. So initial believing, to initial obeying, to perfected abiding, to perfected loving. Right? That's sort of the, the order that we see of how things happen in these passages from the Johns. Now, the letter then uses some new language to describe the result of what a world filled with love is like. And the letter says, And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? But the one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So it is through our love, through our faith, that there is a great victory to be won. Well, we still need to go through the steps, right? We go from believing, obeying, abiding, loving. Now, the takeaway from this theological process is this. If we are willing to commit to love, to Christ and to each other, then we will be able to participate, and become part of this great victory of God. Now, I had these principles of commitment, 
belonging, and victory in mind when I reflected on some of the things that were going on this week for me. Now, the first relates to sports. I always like talking about sports up here. Now, one of the very first things we think about when we hear the word victory is sports, right? Okay. You're not agreeing with me, but I'm going to say that that is, in fact, the case. Now, generally, people like to be on the winning side. And this is one of the reasons why all sorts of different people in an area can bond through vicariously experiencing victory for their local sports team. You know, when the teams are winning, this feeling of connection with the team is very high. For example, when the Boston Celtics eliminated the Miami Heat on Wednesday, I was very happy. For years, the Heat have been a thorn in the Celtics' side. They were the ones that eliminated the, the heavily favored Celtics last season. And so when the Celtics finally won in indecisive fashion, I thought, thank goodness, we finally got that monkey off our backs. Now it's time for us to take the next step towards a championship. All right? But on the other side, when our teams are losing, our connection with them can be very tenuous. For example, when the Boston Bruins failed to eliminate the Toronto Maple Leafs two times in a row due to some very poor shooting in the first uh, periods, I thought to myself, what is wrong with them? Those losers can't do anything right. Now, of course, when they beat the Leafs in overtime last night, I thought, oh, good. Now we're ready for Florida. See the difference there? <laughs> right. So rooting for a championship team is a sign of affection, but to be fair, there's not a lot of commitment involved. Now, we may spend a lot of money on tickets and paraphernalia to demonstrate our loyalty, maybe tattoos for some of us. But outside of that time and that attention, not a lot is asked for us to actually contribute to that victory. We can, in fact, enjoy that victory without really having earned it ourselves. However, when things get tough, when things to people start to lose, when things actually are required of us, you want to have the, the team in town, you're going to have to start paying for tickets. Oh, well, not going to do that. That's when we break our connection and we end up isolating ourselves from the people and from the groups that we said we cared about. Now, this same idea applies when we're working together to accomplish some goal. When the going gets tough, we break that connection, and we think we can do better by ourselves. Now, this recently happened to my son, Finn. Now, for those of you who have met Finn, you know that he's very warm and he's kind, but he's not the most outgoing person in the entire world. And throughout high school, whenever he had to do group work, it was a bit of a struggle. Most of the time he was working with his best friend. Everything worked out fine. But now he's in college and he's done some group work. And so and it has been very good so far, except for one class. And that is his human rights advocacy class, which fulfills a history requirement. Now, the group he was with simply did not mesh together. Um, their schedules didn't align and one member was really anxious about the entire process. She would text so quickly that Finn would put down the phone, go take the dogs out, come back and there were 50 texts waiting for him. This person was very anxious and finally she was so upset about everything that she said we can't work together. We're, we're going to break up the group, even though Finn had tried everything he could to try to bring them together. And so the other two said, well, we're out too. And now Finn was left to do the entire project on his own, no matter what his, uh, his attempts were. They all were going to do the project on their own because they didn't want to deal with the tension. They didn't want to try to compromise. And so now they all had to do four per people's worth of work themselves in order to get to what they wanted to do. And Finn knows that his final project, no matter how much hard work he put into it, is not gonna be as good as if he, they had been able to work together. To return to our theological language, commitment to faith and obedience allows for connection. That connection leads to success. But abandoning commitment leaves us fractured alone and unable to get the things that we want. That was a third thing that happened to me this week. That also involved the ideas of commitment and belonging and success. 
I attended a webinar put on by the Hartford International Uni University for Religion and Peace, and the webinar was called Small Church, Large Presence. It was led by researchers and pastors from both the United Church of Christ and the Episcopal Church. Now, one observation that all these researchers and all their surveys had was that small churches, like our own, are under a lot of stress, and they feel bad about themselves. Their fears that they're not going to be able to pay the bills or keep the building open. And they may feel like this is because they may have done something wrong. There must be something bad about them that's not good enough. They're not being chosen. They feel like that spearmint candy at the bottom of the bowl. But when we look at our church and our average attendance, it's not very atypical. At least within the two denominations we examine, and I think this is true for a lot of denominations and church groups as well, 66% of churches had an average attendance of 50 people or less. Let me say that again. 66%, two-thirds of churches had an average attendance of 50 people or less. Now, almost every congregation is getting older and smaller, but, and that makes us feel inadequate. But that's not the case. Being small is not a bad thing. It can back, back to be a wonderful and important and valuable thing. And this is where this idea of obeying and abiding comes in. If we look at the raw numbers of attendees and donations in small churches, their overall impact seems really small. Those numbers bring us down. Tell us we can't do it. But those aren't the best metrics to look at. If you look at these other metrics, what percentage of attendees volunteer for the church? What percentage of attendees give generously to the church, either by pledging or by regularly putting money in the plate on a consistent basis? If you look at those metrics, small churches are the ones that are the most vital. Small churches are the ones where the people are most engaged. And I think back at our annual meeting we had in January. I looked around the sanctuary and asked, I was thinking to myself, well, who might step up to join this committee or that committee that we had a, uh, an, a, uh, an empty uh, vacancy in? And I noticed that I was looking at everyone. I said, everyone that is able to volunteer is already volunteering. They're already doing what they can for the sake of the church. And I thought that other, that I thought about that sports analogy again. You know, those big churches, they're kind of like when you're rooting for a winning sports team. You know, there's a big show, you all go to it, there's, you know, you see something interesting, you clap your hands, you go home, you have a good time. You know, you don't actually do, there's not a whole lot that's expected of you to just show up, engage, you know, participate, and then leave. But our church and other churches like ours, small churches, aren't like a fickle fan base that participates in something vicariously and then cuts and runs when things get tough, when things that are difficult are asked of them. We all contribute, and we all give what we can because we love this congregation and we truly love each other. Now let's talk about victory. If our goal is to double the size of the budget of our church and to have hundreds of people come in every Sunday, that's going to require a lot of work. And given all the variables of society and location and demographics, it's going to be extremely difficult to pull off. However, if our goal is to form strong relationships with each other, to show compassion for each other when we are in our time of need, to write cards, and go on visits, even though you're not part of the card writing committee or the visitation committee. We're doing a wonderful job. We are good at abiding in God. We are good at abiding with one another. Now, we're not perfect. We get distracted by the problems of life. We may not come to church for a couple weeks in a row. You know, we may do things that get on each other's nerves from time to time. And I think you can all remember times that's happened to you. But when we abide in God and with each other, we do not turn away from that, our relationships. 
and then think, well, we can do better on our own. The people who do attend this church and who do watch our services online love this congregation because it is small and intimate and traditional and loving. There's a lot of other places they could go. But if you walk in this door and you feel this love, this is where you want to be. We provide something that a big church with all its wonderful programs and ministries cannot, and that is authentic connection. We abide with God and we abide with each other. And this gives us the strength, gives us the hope, gives us the love at the times when we need it the most. Now we still have a lot of challenges ahead and this is where this, uh, this webinar had some very, I think, interesting advice about what it means to abide with each other. Now decades ago, most congregational or UCC and, and Episcopal churches were very self-sufficient. You know, they were the big church in town or they are one of several flavors of churches in town, all of which kind of had rivalries with each other. You know, they all had their own suppers and bazaars and, and uh, yard sales and youth groups and vacation Bible schools and mission trips. They all did these things by themselves. But times have changed and now there is simply not enough energy or resources to do all the things that we all used to do by ourselves anymore. For example, I am so excited about the May breakfast this Saturday. I'm so excited that I'm looking forward to waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday to go and participate in it. All right? We should all be excited about this. And more importantly, I think we should be thankful for those who have put so much hard work and effort into making this a reality. But if we think about it, we're not having a May breakfast every month. We're not having meals and events here at the church as often as we may have done in the years past because it does require so much of us and so much of our volunteers. There's just not the ability to reach out and to love as many people to bring them into the doors as we really want. Now, in the face of these challenges, we are left with two choices, and not just us, but all these small churches uh, that are out there. Now, we can go it alone, or we can try to make the sometimes more difficult commitment to increase our relationships, to abide further with God and with the community by seeking stronger ties to other groups. These may be other congregations. They could be groups in town. They could be local institutions. You know, for example, we may be good at one thing, have one great tradition, but we need a little extra help to make it happen. And maybe those people can come in and give us an extra set of volunteers. Maybe they can put it in their newsletters, use what they know to kind of help us out. And maybe another group is really good at something else that we're not so great at, but we can send a few volunteers their way. We can talk to our friends and spread the word. And now we have, instead of several ministries that are hard to get off the ground, now we have two ministries that are now going on at different places, but are still able to reach out and to share the love of God with the community. And I think this is especially true when we talk about ministry with youth and children. It's hard to get a, con a youth group confirmation class going, but if we had a bunch of churches working together, we could really do some wonderful things. God calls us to abide with one another and to, and now in that call to be people of love, we are now asked to abide with others. Now one of our greatest strengths in this case may be one of our greatest weaknesses, and that is that we are a traditional Yankee church and we embody the values of family, hard work, and independence. And with this comes a stubbornness to do things our own way, and a certain distrust of others. You know it's true, right? Now I think of Finn's group project, for example. But I think that if we're willing to really commit ourselves to do the, the tougher war, comfortable tasks, there's gonna be a great future for us. We're not gonna lose the intimacy of our small group. We're not gonna lose our traditional worship, our traditional values. We're just going to take the next step to do what we can to more fully abide in God's love, to take our faith, to commit to it, to obey God's commandment, and then find that connection and that effective, victorious love in the world. 
for there's a lot of great work to do, a lot of love to share, and I think a lot of victories to be won. Let us pray. Heavenly Lord, we are a people called to love. May our faith, obedience, and commitment bring us to abide with you and know your victory. Amen. Our communion hymn today is in the Black New Century Hymnal, and it is number 349, I Come With Joy. Let's all, in that spirit of joy, stand up and let us all sing together.
In the same way, Jesus took also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we are bold to proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table that our eyes may be open and we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ has died. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ.
cup of salvage. Take and drink. Let us pray. We remember our Lord Jesus Christ the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup. He has been made known to us in our midst. So let us then greet him in the hospitality of our hearts. Let us welcome Christ as our love, as our sovereign and our savior. Let us welcome Christ our friend and our companion. Let us welcome Christ our teacher and our guide. Let us welcome Christ our strength and our solace. And let us abide daily in Christ, that he may abide daily with us. Please, O oh Lord, let it be so. Amen. Our closing hymn is from the Black New Century Hymn. And it is number 493, O oh Jesus, I have promised. Let us all again rise if we are able, and let us all sing together. Jesus' name. Amen. Let us turn to our neighbor and say,